The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss glioblastoma from diagnosis to treatment. My name is Vince Rock, Program Manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ryan Merrill. Dr. Merrill is the Director of the Neuro-Oncology Program at North Shore Neurological Institute. His specialties include primary brain tumors and meningiomas. He has presented papers and posters at numerous professional meetings and conferences, including the American Academy of Neurology, the Society for Neuro-Oncology, and the American Brain Tumor Association. Dr. Merrill earned his Doctorate of Medicine from the University of Alabama School of Medicine. He completed his residency at the Mayo School of Graduate, Me Graduate Medical Education and a fellowship at the Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Merrill is a member of the American Medical Association, Society for Neuro-Oncology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Society for Neuro-Oncology, and the American Academy of Neurology. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Merrill. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Vince, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. So the topic we're going to discuss today is glioblastoma, and it's a very broad topic, and there's a lot of information to cover. I may not be able to cover everything on the slides, but that's why they're yours to view, and we can uh, answer questions that we may not have time to cover. So I'd like to start out by talking about um, that I just, the only disclosure I have is that I have served on the advisory board for AVV. I'd like to start by way of introduction by saying that glioblastoma is a primary brain tumor, and that's to be distinguished from other kinds of tumors that spread from the body, which we call metastatic tumors. And uh, these are fairly uncommon cancers relative to other cancers. And in fact, um, they rank roughly on number 15 or so on the list of all cancers. Um, however, there is a significant number in the U.S. diagnosed every year, roughly about 20,000 when you include, include all the primary tumors. And unfortunately, there are a lot of deaths that occur from these tumors. So compared to other cancers, the survival is not as good. The, um, they are incurable by definition, although we do have some patients that do extremely well and have really outlived the averages. And um, the key to thing about glioblastoma is that it typically affects middle-aged people, roughly over the age of 50 or 55, although we do see them in younger patients as well. And there really are no known risk factors for developing these tumors, aside from a few rare things. So this is just a pie chart to show the distribution of primary brain tumors. And what you can see on this slide is that glioblastomas make up roughly 16% of all the primary brain tumors. That includes some of the benign tumors, though, like meningioma. Now, what about in terms of the gliomas, which by definition are malignant? You can see that glioblastoma makes up roughly a little more than half of all these tumors. And then there's a, a small distribution of, of the other lower grade tumors grade threes and grade twos. So risk factors, um, they can affect all ages, um, but glioblastoma, as I mentioned earlier, usually affects middle-aged and older adults. And because we as a society are living longer, we are diagnosing more of these tumors, especially in the elderly population. If someone has had an exposure to ionizing radiation like treatments uh, for other tumors uh, as a child, like if you had leukemia and you had radiation to the head, um, you could later develop a brain tumor. Um, these are pretty rare cases, though, and there has been a great search to look for environmental risk factors. We, we probably, I think most of us think there probably is something in the, in the environment that is a factor, but that has yet to be identified. These rarely run in families. So one of the things that we can say with confidence when we see patients is that it's very unlikely that you will have a risk of uh, passing this on to your children, for example. 
So how, are we, how do we classify these tumors? They're classified by the cells that make them up so that we can see under the microscope. And so they are either astrocytomas, oligodendrogliomas, or ependymomas. And then they're graded by microscopic features. So what you see in the upper panel here is a low-grade tumor. It doesn't have as, um, um, nearly as many cells as down here. And in the bottom panel, this is really a very good example of a glioblastoma. A lot of very bizarre-looking cells that normally do not exist in the brain. And then these sheets of what we call necrosis, which is essentially um, where the tumor is outgrowing its blood supply. So we grade them as 2, 3, and 4. And glioblastoma is actually the same thing as a grade 4 astrocytoma. So it's important to know the terminology when we're talking about these tumors. What about pathologically? So the high-grade tumors and the low-grade tumors are kind of broken down by different features. So we talked about age as being important. Um, the high-grade tumors are, are highly malignant. What about the low-grade glioma? So these are, when we talk about low-grade, we usually talk about grade 2. Well, these affect typically younger people, roughly from age 30 to 50. They tend to be malignant. They are malignant, but they're less aggressive. It's important to know that these are still malignant tumors, and they will eventually, over time, transform into high-grade tumors in most cases. But some of these patients will have very long-term survival, especially the oligodendroglioma patients. So what are good prognostic factors in glioblastoma? Well, if you're younger in general, you typically will do better. That doesn't always hold true, though. Good performance status, what this means is how fit are you neurologically? Do you have a neurologic deficit that um, affects you? How much of the tumor is resected? And there's various studies that have looked at the definition of a, of a full resection, meaning full removal of the tumor. And most people would agree on somewhere between 70 or 80% of the tumor removed at the first surgery. And then, of course, lower-grade tumors typically do better than higher-grade tumors. But what has really changed prognostication is molecular markers. And this is true for all different kinds of cancers outside of the brain tumor world. But for what we have with gliomas, and particularly glioblastoma, these are the two most important ones, the MGMT promoter methylation and the IDH1 mutation. So to explain what these mean, I have a couple of slides. And this is a little bit complicated. What I really want you to come away with from these slides is that having methylation of the MGMT promoter is a better prognostic factor. And that's shown in this curve where they analyzed patients who were on the original temozolomide clinical trial. And they found that if you had methylation of this promoter, you have better survival. It turns out, though, that only about 40% of patients with glioblastoma have the methylated promoter. And exactly what does this mean, and, and, and what does this do for you? So this is a little complicated, but basically what's happening is if you have methylation of this gene promoter, you're not expressing a protein. And when that protein is expressed, it actually undoes the damage that temozolomide is doing to the tumor DNA. So again, this is a, a concept that's difficult for me to explain. I think all of us in the field would say this because it's sort of like saying a double negative. But the whole point is that having the methylation is a better prognostic factor. Now, what if you are unmethylated? Um, well, you know, it, it's less favorable, but it's not black and white. You know, there are other things that um, lead to good or bad prognosis. So I never like to tell patients that, you know, you're destined to fail if you have unmethylated MGMT. And this is a test that can be routinely done on tumors after surgery. And many hospitals like ours will routinely do these in-house nowadays. What about IDH1? This is an enzyme. It stands for isocitrate dehydrogenase. And the key point, again, to come away from this slide is that having the mutation is a good thing. So the mutation is actually quite uncommon in glioblastoma. Only about 5% of patients will have it but it leads to significantly better prognosis. So on the order of overall survival of 45 months, which is very significant for glioblastoma. Whereas in the low-grade glioma population, there's a significantly higher percentage of patients that have the mutation. 
And this in part explains why low-grade gliomas have better survival and prognosis. Now I want to talk about some general features of glioblastoma, and a lot of these are in common to any kind of glioma. So what are symptoms that would lead to diagnosis? Well, we usually like to break it down into what we call generalized or focal symptoms. So generalized symptoms are ones that don't necessarily localize to where the tumor is coming from. So headaches. Of course, headaches, we always like to tell people, is not the sign of having a brain tumor. They're usually more than just a headache. Seizures, even though they can often lateralize to one side of the body, uh, we think of this as a generalized symptom. And then confusion, so, you know, clouding of thinking, which oftentimes is kind of slowly progressive, can be subtle, maybe not even realized in, until hindsight after a diagnosis is made. And focal symptoms, of course, are based on the anatomy of the tumor, where it's located in the brain. So if a tumor is affecting visual fibers, you may have loss of vision on one side of the body. Or what if it's involving the motor fibers? Then you might have weakness on one side. And because most brain pathways are crossed pathways, if the tumor's on the left side, it's usually going to affect the right side of the body and vice versa. If it's in a language area, you might have trouble speaking. And then if it's in the back of the brain, like in the cerebellum, for example, you may have difficulty with coordination or balance. So it all depends on where it is all about the real estate. So then what happens based on these symptoms is usually an imaging study will be obtained. Sometimes it's a CAT scan, but will often lead to an MRI. And MRIs reveal these tumors, but they are not always specific. So you have to be careful to um, make sure that it's actually a tumor, because some things can look like a tumor and turn out to be something else. This top panel shows what a low-grade glioma often looks like. These typically do not cause what we call contrast enhancement, where dye is leaking out into the brain. They tend to often come out to the edges of the brain, and this is an example of someone who ended up having an oligodendroglioma. Whereas a glioblastoma tends to be very aggressive in terms of causing this, what we call contrast enhancement, so leakage of dye, often has this central dark appearance, so we call this ring enhancing, and this is um, often the hallmark of a glioblastoma. But it's very important that we can never be definitive about what a mass might be until we actually have a piece of it through either a biopsy or a surgical resection. So this slide is just to show you that as a patient, you are being in uh, incorporated into a team effort. So you have multiple players involved. Usually at the beginning you'll have a neurosurgeon. Sometimes you'll be introduced to the neuro-oncologist before surgery, but usually right afterwards. Then you will often go on to have radiation treatments done by a radiation oncologist. Of course, nurses cannot be underemphasized. Often will have tremendous continuity with patients throughout their course. Social workers are helpful in terms of um, helping with psychosocial needs. And then these two are sort of the behind the scenes players. The person that interprets the tissue is the pathologist. And then the people that help us read the MRI scans are called neuroradiologists. Of course, the patient is driving all of this care ultimately. So what do we usually do if we see something like I just showed you on an MRI scan? Well, the first thing is that we like to meet together if we can, and at our institution we find this very helpful to have not only the neurosurgeon but the neuro-oncologist also meet together with the patient. We typically have a discussion before surgery that involves something like, it looks like you may have a brain tumor. We're not entirely certain until we can actually get a sample of it, and this is what might happen if it turns out to be a tumor. It's always important to be careful about this because we have been fooled before. And some of the things that can mimic a brain tumor are things like an abscess, which is an infection in the brain, or an, a multiple sclerosis-like lesion, or a stroke. And we have certainly um, gone into surgeries thinking that something was going to be a tumor, and it turned out to be something else. If we have high enough suspicion that something is a glioblastoma, 
we try to do a maximum surgery, so remove as much of the tumor as possible and not leave the patient with a permanent deficit. And that second part is very important because what follows is treatments that are going to uh, cause certain symptoms that the, the more strong you are and the higher level of fitness, the better you are to, able to tolerate them. The perioperative management in the hospital often involves a discussion of what is the tumor, and then in some cases, a patient would need to have some rehab of some sort, which can be done in the hospital. So I want to talk a little bit about surgery and some of the innovative techniques that have been done in the last few years. So as we talked about, we want a maximal surgical resection that's safe. Um, and we know that from that earlier slide that if you can get more than 70%, but ideally 90%, 95%, that's a good prognostic factor. Now, one thing to emphasize about glioblastoma is that it cannot be cured by surgery, and really none of the gliomas can, because these tumors are very microscopically infiltrating into the brain. And so even if someone says they took out 100%, I mean, that's a great thing, because it, what, what that says is that you can no longer see that ring-enhancing mass on the follow-up MRI, but we all know that there are tumor cells around, and that's why you have to have additional treatments beyond surgery. So what are some ways to improve surgical resections or try to remove as much tumor as possible? Well, one is to do a surgery awake, which we'll talk about. Another one is using fluorescent dyes to help visualize the tumor. Another one is endoscopic techniques, which uh, involve less disruption of brain. We, we refer to those as minimally invasive surgeries. And then using intraoperative MRI to guide surgery is another technique that is used at some centers. So I want to talk about a few of these examples. This was a patient of ours, 62-year-old, who presented with headaches, and he was found to have this ring-enhancing mass in the right frontal lobe. And so whenever you look at an MRI, the orientation is this side is right side, this side is left side, as if you're looking up at the patient. And because this was in a, a good location for surgery, um, there was a very nice resection done by our surgeon. And he actually used a fluorescent dye to help him visualize exactly where were the margins of the tumor. And that's what this looks like here. So this is a dye that's injected into veins, and it uh, lights up, and because glioblastomas have very abnormal blood vessels that supply them, you can use this to your advantage to help you see the edges of the tumor, which in the hope is that you can get a better surgery as a result. The next case is a 58-year-old man who presented with a seizure, and he had a relatively small tumor that was located, however, in the dominant hemisphere, so left temporal lobe. So typically a very um, uh, kind of scary location when it comes to doing surgery in terms of the potential to cause risk in terms of language. And so in this case, this patient's surgery was done while he was awake, which sounds kind of weird, but some of you have maybe had this kind of a surgery. Um, the, the thing is that you probably know that the brain itself does not have pain fibers, and so you can take advantage of that by doing awake surgery. And the patient can help you to guide you in terms of surgery. In this case, it was all about talking to this patient and make sure, making sure that he didn't have any deterioration in his language during the surgery. And as a result, we were able to achieve a very nice surgical resection. The last case is a 42-year-old female who presented with some vision changes, and she had some cognitive changes as well. And she had this mass, ring-enhancing mass, centered in the left thalamus. Now, this is traditionally a location where many people would not even attempt to operate in. But through the use of an endoscopic port device and our typical operative monitoring, our surgeon was able to do a, an incredible surgery where he removed all of the tumor. And this is what this looks like. So this is a combination of using what we call diffusion tensor imaging mapping, which maps fibers in the brain. And then this is actually this dime-sized port that is inserted through the folds of the brain, so that you're disrupting less of the brain, and you're able to um, achieve 
uh, very nice surgeries through this. Now I have to just give you a disclaimer that I'm not a surgeon, so my ability to comment on the actual mechanics of this is uh, very limited. But what I can say is that this is a new technique that we have found to be very effective. So what are some of the medical issues that we deal with? And these are ones that, you know, usually at the beginning of the diagnosis and then often throughout the course of the disease that we're managing. So I'm going to cover each one of these categories on this slide. So cerebral edema, also known as brain swelling. So whenever people talk about swelling, you know, technically the term is cerebral edema. Um, the way we treat brain swelling should be based on the patient and less on the MRI scan or the CT scan. So is the patient having a neurologic deficit that would warrant steroids? Now the only exception to that is if you see an MRI scan where there's a lot of pressure being built up as a result of a tumor and maybe a patient is not symptomatic yet, you might start steroids. And the one that we use most commonly is called dexamethasone, also known as decadron. Um, this has been around for many, many years. It was actually considered the first treatment for brain tumors back in the uh, roughly 1940s and 50s. Um, the thing about Decadron is that in the outpatient setting, it, it usually can be given twice daily quite effectively. So one of the things that we often do is if we see someone getting it more than twice a day, we, we will um, taper it down to twice a day because it has a fairly long half-life or activity in the body. Um, it's a good idea to take the second dose of Decadron in the afternoon because one of the side effects is insomnia. So if you're taking it at 8 or 9 p.m., you may have a really rough night sleeping. The range of dose is roughly between 4 and 16 milligrams. Once you get beyond 16 milligrams as an outpatient, then you're going to run into more side effects, the so kind of diminishing returns. Steroid myopathy is an important side effect to know about, and this is often what limits the long-term use of dexamethasone. The way that manifests is it's a weakness of the thigh muscle. So there's two primary ways that that is seen. One is it, ha it causes people to have difficulty getting out of chairs, and the second one is climbing stairs. In some cases, it can be so debilitating that even walking itself on flat surfaces is very impaired. The good news about steroid myopathy is that it is reversible once the steroids are tapered off. What about seizures? The seizures are fairly common. It turns out that glioblastoma patients have seizures at various times during their illness. They actually have less seizures in general than low-grade gliomas. Um, so that's kind of a takeaway point, which is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, these seizures are often what we call complex partial. What that means is that they start on one side of the body, so you might have a little bit of twitching of the arm, for example, and then all of a sudden the patient will sort of lose consciousness, uh, and in some cases it could even generalize to all the body, which is what we call a tonic-clonic or a grand mal seizure. These seizures are treated similar to the way that we treat epilepsy in our neurology population. We usually start with one medication, we maximize the dose, and then if we need a second medication, we add it on after that. We prefer second generation drugs, and what that means is the drugs that have been around for the past 10 or 15 years, which have widely almost replaced the old drugs like Dilantin and Tegretol and Depakote, for example. There's no role for pre preventing seizures in someone who's never had a seizure. So we typically do not just willy-nilly start these on patients unless there's actually a seizure. And this is the list of the second generation drugs that many of you are familiar with. Tefra or Leviteracetam is by far the most widely used drug and the reason for that is that it's easy to start at an effective dose. Some of these other drugs on the list, like Lamotrigine, which is a very good example, Lamictal, is a wonderful drug, but it takes a long time to get up to an effective dose. And you can see some of the others on this list. Like I said, we usually try to get by with one medication, but if we need a second one, we will add that on. 
What about fatigue? This is a very common symptom, probably one of the most common symptoms for anyone that's been through radiation. It's really a reflection of the side effects of radiation with some degree of effect of the brain tumor. It usually peaks uh, halfway through the course of radiation. So the six-week course of radiation that we're going to talk about here soon uh, is usually seen toward the middle to the end of the radiation. And in some patients, that will linger even well beyond the end of radiation. The trouble with fatigue is there's really no proven treatment. So one of the great breakthroughs in our field would be to more effectively treat fatigue. But there are certainly things that we try, and exercise can be very helpful. I encourage all my patients, even before we start radiation, to get in the habit of daily exercise. And we're talking about just casual walking, nothing, nothing heavy. And then there are some drugs that we'll use. So methylphenidate or Ritalin is what most people associate with treating attention deficit disorder. But it actually has some proven um, uh, effectiveness in cancer-related fatigue. And modafinil and arbidafinil are two of the newer drugs that we sometimes use in some of our patients. But these are very plus minus. You know, in some cases they can really help, in other cases they don't help at all. So what about blood clots? So when we talk about blood clots, the technical term is DVT or PE, which stands for pulmonary embolism, so deep venous thrombosis pulmonary embolism. One of the things that a lot of people in medicine don't realize is that glioblastomas have a very high tendency to cause blood clots. They're roughly number three on the list of all cancers in terms of their ability to cause clots. We typically like to use blood thinners over inferior vena cava filters. One of the things that is misunderstood among our medicine colleagues is that you, the, 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 the thinking that you cannot put a brain tumor patient on a blood thinner because it's going to cause bleeding in the brain, and that's simply not the case. You know, there have been good studies that have shown that the risk of bleeding from a blood thinner is on the order of about 5%, very low. We usually like to use low molecular weight heparin, which is commonly referred to as Lovenox, um, probably the most commonly used product on the market, over warfarin or Coumadin. Um, and then there's newer drugs, the factor 10 inhibitors. So we've been excited to see that as these have gained approval in treating DVTs in, in the uh, medical population, we're also able to use them in the glioblastoma population. And these are drugs like Eliquis and Pradaxa, for example. So there are settings where you cannot use anticoagulation. So if a blood clot is discovered immediately after surgery or if there's active bleeding in the brain, you're really kind of forced to use one of these filters, which is inserted uh, with a catheter through a leg vein. So it's important to note that, of course, these tumors are debilitating psychologically. Um, so we, we rely heavily on our colleagues in social work, psychiatry, psychology, um, obtaining uh, uh, ways of determining if someone is depressed or fatigued by uh, questionnaires that we hand out is, is very helpful because otherwise we may not ever know, uh, a patient may not necessarily volunteer this information. And having a brain tumor support group is a very helpful thing and I hope that many of you out there have attended one in your area because you really gain a lot by um, seeing what other people are going through who have similar uh, conditions. So now this uh, next part of the talk is talking about standard therapies for glioblastoma. So this is where we really get into the treatment. So up until now, we kind of talked about an introduction about, you know, what are these tumors? How are they diagnosed? Um, what the imaging of them looks like? What are some of the symptoms that you're going to deal with and how are those managed? Now we're going to talk specifically about the treatments that we give that are specific to treating the tumor. And then the last part is going to talk about some of the emerging treatments that are in the setting of clinical trials. So this is just a timeline that shows you, you know, glioblastomas have been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, glucocorticoids, dexamethasone, that was really the first drug that came wide into acceptance. And this is actually putting it around the early 1960s, but it was really probably in, in, in a you know, earlier than that. 
And then came radiation, kind of roughly in the mid to late 1970s. Started using um, these drugs called BCNU uh, and, and CCNU, which are sort of the forerunners to temozolomide. Uh, and then we had a type of wafer that was inserted in the uh, surgical cavity called gliadel. That was in the mid-90s. And then the most recent breakthrough was temozolomide, which came into wide use around 2005 in combination with radiation. So we're going to talk about these standard treatments that include radiation, chemotherapy, and tumor treating fields, which um, actually could have been, tumor treating fields could have been added to this plot um, coming in uh, most recently, uh, about two years ago. So what is uh, the standard treatment? We refer to it as the Stup regimen after Dr. Stup. Um, who was the lead author on this large uh, clinical trial that was done that actually showed that temozolomide or temidar had effectiveness when combined with radiation. So this is a six-week course of radiation, and this drawing down here shows you how a radiation field is delivered. So it's a fairly wide field where you have the, the highest concentration around the margins of the tumor, but then you have a certain amount of scattering of the radiation and this is largely the reason why some of the side effects like fatigue and cognitive impairment are realized from radiation. Now, temozolomide or temidar is actually a pill form of chemotherapy, so it's convenient for the patient because it can be taken at home. Um, radiation is delivered in a standard dose across the board, so we never deviate from this, the 60 gray um, dose, although there are active clinical trials that are testing uh, slightly higher doses of radiation. Typically 30 fractions is the routine, so Monday through Friday uh, with breaks on the weekend. And then Temidar is taken during radiation every day, including the weekends, and then afterwards, after a month break, we have 6 to 12 cycles of Temidar given on this standard 5 out of 28 day schedule, so 5 days on, 23 days off. The main issue with Temidar is what we call thrombocytopenia, or low platelets. So Temidar rarely causes a profound drop in white blood cell count, but it does often have a significant effect on platelets. The good news about that is that it's rare that someone has bleeding as a result of that, but if the count falls below a certain threshold, we are obligated to hold the Temidar until it improves. So this is actually showing you what does Temidar do. So I, I really like the concept of knowing the mechanisms of things. I think it's very helpful to understand things better. So this is a drug that is very interesting because once it hits the stomach, it's immediately broken down into a smaller molecule. And that's very important because one of the huge limitations to treating brain tumors is to find drugs that will actually get across the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a very special evolutionary um, mechanism that we have as humans that basically keeps a lot of things that would be toxic to us out of the brain. But one of those things is many of the chemotherapy drugs that are used in other cancers. And so this is the reason why we use Temidar. And what Temidar does is it's in what we call an alkylating agent. And what that means is that it actually attaches these methyl groups CH3 onto certain positions of the DNA of the tumor. And what that does is it ultimately leads to an unraveling of the tumor DNA, and ultimately the tumor dies as a result of that. So whenever we speak of die or death in tumors, it's a good thing, because that's what we want to do. Temidar has some nausea, and we also we already talked about how it can affect platelets, and that's because like any kind of chemotherapy, Temidar can affect rapidly dividing cells in the body, including the bone marrow, and that's the reason why we get the low platelets. What about tumor treating fields? I mentioned this was the most recent breakthrough in terms of standard treatment. This was based on a large clinical trial that was randomized where patients received either the tumor treating fields or not. And so this is what it looked like. They had 700 patients with glioblastoma. They randomized them to one group or the other. 
they all went through radiation and, and Temidar, so the standard treatment. But there were some issues with this trial. One is that there was no sham device. So if you were randomized to not have the device, you knew it. And those who had the device uh, knew it. So that can lead to a confounding effect of the trial. And those who had the device arguably could have had closer follow-up and good uh, palliative care. Also, there was crossover allowed, so if you progressed later on, you could actually be eligible for the TTS device. The device is not trivial. It requires head shaving. Um, it is, there's a backpack that's attached to the device that you have to carry around with you. It has to be worn for most of the day, and it requires maintenance of, specifically of the battery. And it's not always covered by insurance. So this is what it looks like. And certainly the data that came out of this trial is compelling. There was, they did demonstrate a survival advantage in the patients treated with the device. But I'd say that this device is probably one of the more divisive things, no pun intended, in the neuro-oncology field, meaning that some people really believe in it, they recommend it to all their patients, other people don't. And a lot of the clinical trials that are designed at least as of now, do not incorporate the TTF device into the trial. So what about treatments when the tumor grows back? So unfortunately, in most cases, a glioblastoma is going to grow back at some point in time. So one of the things we think about very heavily is clinical trials, looking at um, promising new treatments. In some cases, a second surgery is done. This is becoming more popular nowadays because some of the clinical trials involve implanting uh, different types of drugs or immunotherapy into the tumor cavity, and they require surgery to be done at the same time. Re-irradiation, sometimes radiation is done a second time. Uh, bevacizumab, which I'll talk about in uh, detail, uh, which many of you know about. Sometimes we use other schemes of giving uh, temozolomide. Lomustine is still an option. Uh, in those who have not or already received tumor treating fields, that's an option. And BCNU wafers or gliadel wafers are sometimes used but have really fallen out of favor, largely because of some of the side effects that can occur with them and the fact that many clinical trials prohibit patients who have ever had gliadel wafers. So what about bevacizumab? This drug is approved for glioblastoma primarily. We sometimes use it in lower grade tumors that have progressed. There were two large clinical trials which showed that it does not add benefit in the newly diagnosed setting. So we almost never use it at the beginning of treatment. It's a drug that's given intravenously every two weeks. It has a very good side effect profile in most patients. Um, with the exception, in some patients that have been on it for a long time, we can see issues with high blood pressure and leakage of protein into the urine. Rarely we see issues with blood clots or strokes. How does this drug work? Different than temozolomide. So it's a VEGF inhibitor. What that means is VEGF is a molecule that stimulates blood vessel growth. What this diagram is showing is abnormal blood vessels that are made by the tumor. This is actually the reason why we see that contrast enhancement on MRIs, because the dye that circulates to these vessels is leaking out, because these are not normal blood vessels in the brain. The whole idea by inhibiting this molecule is that you promote this event over here, where the vessels are pruned and ultimately the tumor dies. Now, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm over bevacizumab roughly around 2008 when it was first tested in glioblastoma. And sadly, that has waned over the years as we have seen that it rarely is the case that a patient will have a long-term survival benefit from this drug. There have been great efforts to look at other ways to target VEGF through these drugs down here, but unfortunately, all of these were shown to be failures in clinical trials. This is a patient of mine, though, who did very well on bevacizumab. He was diagnosed in 2010 
and he was actually enrolled on one of those newly diagnosed pepizumab trials called Avaglio. And his tumor shrunk significantly as he went through radiation and Temidar. And it was pretty clear that he was getting bevacizumab. And then ultimately, after we stopped the drug, because he was having problems with his kidneys, the tumor grew back. And then we put him back on, on a, um, a longer uh, schedule every three weeks, ultimately four weeks. And the tumor shrank again. His kidneys have held up, and he's still doing well um, as of recent times. So. We think that bevacizumab can improve symptoms, what we call progression-free survival, may lengthen the time for tumors to progress. Because it can be effective at decreasing that brain swelling, then you can have improvement in deficits, less need for steroids, but unfortunately not impacting survival in most. So where to go with it? It has not been retired. Um, it is uh, still considered the standard at recurrence. Um, it's important to try to find things that we can identify about tumors that would suggest, well, who's going to respond to bevacizumab or not? It's still used in combinations, and most recently there's combinations of bevacizumab with immunotherapy. But sort of the cynical question is, is it just a super steroid? You know, does it really have much impact on the tumor? And I think that it's not fair to say this yet, but um, that's for the cynics to say. So it's important to talk about treating GBM in the elderly. Um, now, no offense to anyone out there, but I didn't define elderly as 70, but the studies defined it that way. So generally speaking, we know that there's a big difference between some 70-year-olds and there's some 85-year-olds that are just as good as 65 year olds. So we try not to discriminate. But what has been known for a long time is that elderly patients do not tolerate radiation as well as younger patients. And so um, what has been shown, though, is that it's better to remove as much tumor as possible, just like in the young population. But what was really looked at was could you shorten the dose and the time of the radiation and have just as good of outcomes with less side effects? And so there was a large study that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that if you give 40 gray instead of 60 with temozolomide, you can actually have good outcomes and less side effects. And it was applicable to anyone regardless of their MGMT status. So that was one of the more uh, groundbreaking recent clinical trials. This was a patient of mine who is in that category. He was 85 when he was diagnosed with this tumor. He had a good surgery. He had radiation to the abbreviated course with 40 gray with temozolomide. And he ultimately had 12 cycles. And he has done extremely well, surprisingly well. And he's the patient that I always remember when I think of, you know, don't count somebody out because they're older. So the last part of this talk is to talk about clinical trials and future treatments. So we kind of went through the standard treatments, which typically are the fractionated radiation with temozolomide, adjuvant temozolomide, some of the things that we do when tumors recur. And what I'm going to show you is some of the more recent uh, clinical trials, but by no means does this cover everything that's being done out there. So first of all, talking about targeted therapies. It's a very important topic. Uh, it, this has been investigated for the past 10 or 15 years and continues to be investigated. This is a cartoon which shows the growth pathways that drive the growth of glioblastoma. And there have been great efforts to antagonize these pathways. If you are able to read the red, these are drugs that are specifically designed to inhibit different portions of these growth pathways. And unfortunately, these have universally failed. The two fa uh, pathways that I want to highlight are these surface receptors, vascular endothelial growth factor, which we talked about related to bevacizumab. And the other one is epidermal growth factor receptor, which we'll refer to as EGFR. 
The reason this is important is that unique to glioblastoma, but seen in other cancers, namely non-small cell lung cancer, a very good example of another tumor that has this receptor. In glioblastoma, this is amplified, which means it's overexpressed, so there's a lot of these protein receptors that are made to drive this growth. There's a specific variant only seen in glioblastoma called EGFRV3. Now, I'm going to show you this in the next couple of slides. This is a receptor that is always turned on. It does not require a growth factor to bind to it. And so there's been a great interest in targeting this pathway. The problem with this is that in glioblastoma, there, be, there can be several of these pathways turned on at the same time. So if you try to inhibit one of them, another one may be driving the growth. Also, there's differences in different parts of the tumor. So one part of the tumor may have one pathway driving its growth, and another may have an entirely different pathway. And then we call that tumor heterogeneity. And if you try to throw a bunch of these red drugs at a patient, the patient will not tolerate these drugs because of all the side effects when you add them together. So rindopipimet is the first uh, drug that came into wide use for targeting EGFRV3. This is that unique receptor to glioblastoma. It turns out this is only seen in roughly 20 to 30 percent of patients. So in order to be eligible for this drug, you had to have your tumor tested for this mutation. There were two trials that were conducted, ACT4 and REACT. ACT4 is newly diagnosed, meaning that patients received the rindopipimet vaccine as they were going through radiation and temozolomide. And unfortunately, this turned out to be a negative trial. And so the rindopipimet has been put on hold. However, the REACT trial, which was phase two, was designed for recurrent glioblastoma, and it involved rindopipimet plus bevacizumab versus placebo plus bevacizumab. It was a smaller study. They had favorable survival data coming out of it. And so we don't know to this day if this drug is active. And this study here kind of begged the question of whether this combination could be active. But it's likely that this will not be taken any further uh, into phase three. Here's another way of targeting the EGFR receptor. This is a drug called ABT414, and this is a unique type of um, way of blocking this receptor because it binds to the receptor and then it has a toxin that is injected into the tumor cell after the binding takes place. Um, this is designed uniquely for the people that have amplification of EGFR, which is seen in a higher percentage of patients, so roughly 50% uh, of patients. And so what this trial involves is getting this intravenous treatment every two weeks. It has a very unique side effect, blurring of the eyes as a result of involvement of the cornea. Um, but what was interesting and compelling is that there were some good responses in this trial that had already been reported and now have been published uh, recently in a, one of our main journals. And so as a result of this favorable response, this was taken from phase one to phase two. And what that means is that in phase one, typically all the patients are getting the drug in different types of doses to try to find the effective dose. And then in phase two, the effective dose is taken and usually randomized. And so now this trial is for people with newly diagnosed glioblastoma that have the EGFR amplification and they go through radiation and temozolomide plus or minus the AVT414. What about immunotherapy? This takes us toward the end here. Immunotherapy is an extremely hot topic, not only in neuro-oncology, but in other parts of oncology. Because for many years, it has been well known that derangements of the immune system lead to tumor growth. So ordinarily, when our immune systems are functioning the right way, they prevent our bodies from developing tumors, including brain tumors. So in the brain tumor world, we have only recently started to think about how can we intervene on this. And this is based on real 
amazing breakthroughs in other tumor types, the, the hallmark of which is metastatic melanoma, which used to be thought of as a disease with no cure, and now the patients with that tumor are having roughly 50% cure rates, and that's on the basis of immunotherapy. So this is a cartoon that demonstrates the immune derangements that are seen in glioblastoma. In the middle here is the tumor cell. And what this is showing is that this is normally the response that you want to have with your immune system. So these are what we call T lymphocytes. And these can be thought of as patrolling around, looking for foreign things that don't belong, and then getting rid of them. So unfortunately, the glioblastoma cell is very smart, and it has things that it secretes on its surface to down-regulate the immune response. And so the idea of all these immunotherapy drugs is to try to shut this down, turn the immune system back on. There's many different categories of immunotherapy. I'm not going to read this slide, but I am going to go through some of the different categories on here. Just wanted to point out from the beginning that giving an antibody is sort of one of the more basic ways of targeting the immune system, and that's the example of rindopipamet, which I showed you earlier. So dendritic cell therapies. These are very interesting therapies that have been uh, tested in glioblastoma over the past few years. And one of them is a clinical trial called ICT-107. And this took uh, dendritic cells. And all these are, are their immune cells that we all have in our own body that are designed to present antigens to lymphocytes. So this is demonstrating a lymph node, and you have a dendritic cell that, you know, is picking up uh, antigens. Antigens are, you know, things that we want our immune system to recognize as foreign. So what this does is it takes some of the antigens from the glioblastoma and presents them, pulses them with these dendritic cells, and ultimately these are presented to the T lymphocytes, which we showed on the last slide, leading to a response against the tumor. This was launched in phase three. It had some good results in a particular immunotype of patients. And then it was put into phase three as a randomized trial in newly diagnosed patients. Unfortunately, this trial was recently halted as a result of the uh, pharmaceutical company going bankrupt. Um, so, there are other kinds of dendritic cell therapies. Another one that I um, could have uh, showed you is the DCVAC, which some of you may know about. Um, but these are all, you know, operating by the same mechanism. So what about gene-mediated treatments? Um, a good example of this is the TOCA-5 trial, which was recently completed in phase two. And this is a very interesting concept. This is a virus that has been engineered when it is inserted at the time of surgery to convert this drug called 5-FC into 5-FU, which is a well-known cancer drug. The idea here is circumventing the blood-brain barrier because if we gave 5-FU to glioblastoma patients through a intravenous route, it would not get into the brain. So some people refer to this as a Trojan horse uh, treatment by, you know, getting, giving a drug that can get into the brain that is converted um, once it gets to its site of activity. So a very interesting concept. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about PD-1 and pd one drugs. Um, these are also referred to as checkpoint inhibitors. And what these do is this what I mentioned earlier on this cartoon is that the glioblastoma has a number of things that it secretes on its surface. And one of them is called PDL1, which interacts with PD1 on the T lymphocyte, leading to death of the immune cell. If you can antagonize or inhibit this interaction with a drug like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, these are the two uh, FDA approved drugs that are used in other cancers then you can lead to this proliferation up here that you want. So um, I mentioned the names of these drugs. There's another way of doing this is giving a pdl one drug, 
um, and this one, Dervolumab, is a representative of that drug, which is being tested in glioblastoma clinical trials. There are a number of approved indications for these drugs in other cancers, and I think the list is actually up to six uh, um, and growing. Um, and there, there are ongoing trials in glioblastoma. This one trial is important because it was really the first large trial that was completed called Checkmate 143. And it was for recurrent glioblastoma. Unfortunately, it was a negative study. But like in many trials, some patients really benefited. For the most part, patients tolerated the drug well without any serious side effects. And so now the idea is trying to combine PD-1 inhibitors with other kinds of immunotherapy like dendritic cell vi uh, vaccines or gene-mediated or others. So lastly, I want to talk about viral therapies, which have had a fair amount of press. Um, these are interesting. Uh, we refer to these as oncolytic viruses or attenuated viruses. And what they are are viruses that are designed not to harm the normal body and not normal brain cells. They're really engineered to bind to receptors that are only on the glioblastoma cell. And this is a list of different viruses that have been tested or have, are on, in ongoing clinical trials right now. And this is a cartoon that shows kind of what's going on here. So the virus comes along and it uh, binds to the surface of the tumor cell. And it starts injecting itself, uh, you know, quote unquote, infecting the tumor cell. But what's interesting about this is that it, it often leads to a secondary immune response, an immune response that we want to turn on that is typically turned off in these patients. So what I want to say in summary is that glioblastoma is an important uh, disease because it really involves a lot of teamwork. You know, there are many different players involved, as I showed you on the earlier slide. It's a very challenging tumor, and we desperately need better treatments for this tumor. Um, there are some newer ways of surgery that can lead to better tumor, tumor removal because we know that is one of the important prognostic factors. There's a lot of medical management that goes into taking care of these patients, and this is the reason why I feel like a neuro-oncologist is an important person to have as part of your team because there's so many little issues that have to be attended to. We talked about the standard treatment of glioblastoma, the importance of abbreviated radiation in elderly patients. The role of bevacizumab is evolving and will continue to evolve. And in terms of the newer treatments, targeted therapies are important, will continue to be important. Uh, even though there's been a lot of failures in that area, these, these treatments will not be abandoned. Immunotherapy is probably the most hot and active area of research right now. And clinical trials are important. Can't underestimate that enough. I think one of the things that sometimes people have a misperception of about clinical trials, and I hear it sometimes from patients, is that I'm going on to this trial to help somebody else. Or, you know, I'm, I'm going on to this trial so they can test what, how I'm going to react to this drug. And the answer to that in 95% of the cases is no. You're going on to this trial because this is a treatment that we really think could help you, you know. And sure, there is an altruistic motivation because other people will learn from you. But really, we believe that this treatment will help you. So with that, I will be happy to take questions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Merrill. So we will now take some questions from our viewing audience. We have time for just a couple today. So the first question comes from one of our viewers. Uh, they ask, for newly diagnosed patients, what are some of the things they should ask themselves when deciding to pursue uh, standard of care treatment versus joining a clinical trial? Yeah, I think that's a great question because I always try to tell patients that, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with standard treatment and it, it is effective when you're newly diagnosed. Um, I think, you know, one of the questions to ask is, um, you know, what, what are the options that you have and how close are they to where you live? So um, a, a, good, a good question that we often get is, you know, should I travel, you know, uh, across the country to look for a clinical trial? And usually the answer to that is that's 
is no. Um, I mean, I would never tell you not to go somewhere. But the fact is that, you know, there's really no one that can say that their clinical trial is better than somebody else's. And when it comes to the treatment involved in going through this tumor and the family support that is needed, it's really better to stay closer to home if you can. Um, and I think that, um, you know, obviously, if you're faced with a decision about maybe you have two clinical trials to pick from, uh, th that's always a, a difficult one. And um, I think what it comes down to a lot of times is, you know, what are the side effects of, of a treatment? Uh, you know, what is the schedule of the drug? Like, how often am I going to need to come there? And then just maybe your own reading of the science. I mean, there's certainly some gut feeling that we all have about certain things when we read about them. Thank you. A uh, follow-up question about clinical trials. Uh, we've heard that sometimes the use of bevacizumab can sometimes preclude people from being part of clinical trials. Is there anything else that people should consider that might preclude them from clinical trials? Yeah, um, I, I mean, uh, like, like I mentioned, the gliadel wafers, um, unfortunately, ha are a big um, exclusion criteria, but thankfully nowadays, um, not many people are using those anymore. Um, if you've ever, um, you know, certain certain basic things like, you know, how, um, where's the tumor located? Um, you know, unfortunately, some trials will say that you have to have just one part of the brain affected. So if you have what's called a multifocal tumor where you have like two or three different spots, there's some trials that will not allow you to, to do them. Um, but Aside from that, like from a patient standpoint, what you are in control of, other than bevacizumab and gliadel wafers, there's not much that, that you can control yourself. Thank you. A, a couple people asked about the role of diet and nutrition and supplements um, as a complement to treatment. Do you have any uh, suggestions for people or any feedback about that? Yeah, that's a topic we cover a lot in clinic. We get uh, questions a lot. And um, at this point in time, there's not any solid evidence that would say that a certain diet is better than another. This is another area of active research. Um, there was a presentation at the recent ABTA family conference about this topic, um, if anyone attended. The, the, the upshot is that the ketogenic diet is probably the one that's receiving the most attention, um, and that diet is not easy to follow. Um, you know, if anyone out there has ever tried to do an Atkins diet, that's kind of what we're talking about. And you all know that, you know, you can do that typically within the first month, and then it becomes more difficult. So a lot of it depends on how motivated you are. I have, I have just a couple of patients who have been able to follow a modified Atkins diet for a long period of time, meaning more than a year. Um, so I think it's it's a very um, still a very compelling area of research. There are about um, three centers that really stand out across the country that are doing research in this area, and uh, even some that are doing it in the context of a clinical trial. Thank you. And we have time for just one more question today. And this question is about tumor location. One of our viewers asked about, uh, are there certain locations in the brain where tumors are a lot easier to treat than others? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the first slide that I showed at the beginning of the patient with the tumor in the right frontal lobe uh, who had the, uh, the dye surgery, uh, I mean, arguably he could have probably had the surgery without the fluorescent dye, but we usually think of the, the frontal lobes are, are one of the better locations if you're going to have a tumor because um, the, um, we often do not see any really devastating effects when you are aggressive and really take out the tumor completely. So I, I, that would definitely stand out as being, you know, the, the better location to have a tumor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Merrill. That is all the time we have for today. Thank you all for joining us, and thanks once again to Dr. Merrill for his wonderful webinar presentation. Besides our free educational webinars, the ABTA has a variety of programs available to help connect patients and caregivers
with information and resources to help support them in their brain tumor journey, as well as publications and resources for healthcare professionals. For more information, please visit ABTA's website at abta.org or call the ABTA Care Line at 800-886-2282. Let's pause for just a moment to conclude our webinar recording.